just a couple moments to get going here with my laptop and the screen. Since I was a small boy, I have heard, and I'm sure many of you fit into this same category, the statement that Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Our Sabbath school quarterly is Jesus is coming soon. But there's very little answer to that statement. Why is Jesus coming soon? Most of the reasons over the years, the last 70 plus years for me, has been very subjective. But in the last couple decades, things have begun to change in two ways. Number one, there has been a deepening understanding of many of the prophecies all over the world within our denomination, outside of the denomination, and among many of our scholars. And so a new era has come. And also, as this particular time has come upon us, we have discovered deeper into some of Ellen White's writings, some of her statements, and really what they mean. And they're very apropos to us right now. And this morning I would like to explore with you one or two objective reasons, not subjective, but objective reasons why Jesus really is coming soon. And I hope by the end of our time together this morning that you will have a growing excitement over the scriptures and some of the wonderful things that we can uncover in God's holy word. My notes are what you're going to be seeing on the screen, and so we'll be following that, and I hope that's of interest and value to you. It occurred during the Passion Week, it all began with a Sunday triumphal entry. Then the temple was cleansed for the second time, apostasy was reaching its peak. Plans to kill Jesus were quickly moving forward. Then, in one of the boldest moves of his ministry, Jesus faced the Jewish leaders right on their own turf, the temple, and condemned them to damnation. That is in Matthew 23. They seemed powerless. Never before, Ellen White said, had such a scene been witnessed. This was Christ's last chance to address that Jewish body before Calvary. Jesus stood calmly, Ellen White says, before them with dignity of a king, as one invested with authority of heaven. He looked unflinchingly upon his adversaries, who had rejected and despised his teachings, and who thirsted for his life, and they had assailed him in great numbers, but their schemes to ensnare and condemn him had been in vain. Challenge after challenge he met, presenting the pure bright truth in contrast to the darkness and errors of the priests and Pharisees. Yet another work remained for Christ to do, another purpose was still to be accomplished. The character of the priests, rulers and Pharisees must be more fully exposed. We're not told in Matthew 23 how long that discourse lasted, but large numbers of people were there watching and listening. I'm sure that it lasted at least two or three hours. 
People who needed to hear his indictment were present. Jesus pronounced seven curses on those leaders. The Bible calls them woe, or in Greek, awe. Though Jesus had already said that the Jewish nation would cease to be his special people, that is in Matthew 21, 43, he did speak in the legal decree that no hope now existed for the Jewish nation. Their probation had closed. What follows the end of a probation? What is the terminal event that God has set in his prophetic prophecies? It is the word desolation. And if you study the Bible and some of the prophetic issues, if you analyze the word desolation, it opens up a whole new world of understanding of what is going to be happening at the end of time, our time. Part of God's warning when time ends is desolation is going to occur. In fact, in the book Great Converse, you may be already aware that Ellen White has devoted a whole chapter on desolation of the earth to help us to understand what is before us. At the end, nothing is left. Following his horrific judicial pronouncement, Jesus gave an extremely important prophecy about that end time period. The preface to all of this were his last words to those Jewish leaders in the temple. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he's personifying the city. Behold, your house is what? Left unto you, and there's that word again, left unto you desolate. This now is where Christ's special end time story begins. The time is tense for all those who were witnesses to what happened, undoubtedly with the disciples also. We can sense in some of the words of the disciples perhaps a little air of tension, kind of not knowing what to say. Christ was a victor, but he didn't bump that silent season of those Jewish leaders. It was a mission supremely executed by Christ. Right and wrong were profoundly delineated. And as they left the precincts of the temple, the disciples awkwardly pointed out to Jesus. I'm sure this had happened many, many times before this point in time. But it seems they were very awkward and they're leaving the temple and the disciples kind of turned and looked at the temple and try to point out to Jesus the wonders of that structure, Matthew 24, 1. Jesus, as if he wasn't listening, began to describe the extent of that desolation. Remember, this is the outcome of apostasy. And one of the key elements of all apocalyptic prophecy Ellen White devoted a whole chapter to that in her book. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm looking, I'm seeing what you're pointing out to me. But I want to share with you, he says, There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And clear the word of silence. They made their way to the Mount of Olives where he began to outline the events and the timing of the end. There were only four disciples that evening that went with Jesus. Peter, James, John, and Andrew were not sure where the others went. But isn't it interesting that it was Matthew, Mark, and Luke who recorded their meeting that night in the Mount of Olives. The four disciples must have transmitted that event with great excitement and intensity. As they sat upon the Mount of Olives, they earnestly asked three questions. And everything we're going to be talking about here this morning relates to these three questions. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? 
and on the end of the world. Sign of the end of the world, Matthew 24, 3. Three questions. When shall these things be? Is a timing question. When shall be the sign of thy coming? An event driven question. You see how these things are unfolding? When shall be the sign of the end of the world? An event driven question. Jesus is about to answer each of these questions, but you will be stunned to know that he focuses most on the when question. Jesus didn't answer their questions immediately. He first gave warnings, one of them, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, that no man deceive you, Matthew 24, 4. He embellished this several times by talking about false Christ. That only referred to people who tried to be like, that not only referred to people who tried to be like the Messiah, but it referred to anyone who has truth that is at variance with the Word of God. Later, Paul would give a similar warning, let no man deceive you when he's talking about the end of time in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. The book of Revelation tells us in over 50 places that at the end Satan will mimic many things that God is trying to teach her to do, always attached to some falsehood. Many experiences could become deceptive challenges unless we know Bible truths correctly. That's one of the reasons our ministry was established over 25 years ago, to try to be very precise in the word, the phrases, and the messages that are in those prophecies. Ellen White says Christ had foretold that deceivers would arise. He had warned the disciples that the church would be in more danger from this evil than from the persecution of her enemies. Again and again, Paul warned the believers against these false teachers. This pearl above all others, she says, they must guard against. For by receiving false teachers, they would open the door to errors by which the enemy would dim their spiritual conceptions and shake the confidence of those who had faith in the gospel. Jesus gave another warning. He says, be careful how you interpret the word wars. This is how he said it. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. It is so tempting to think the end is near from the horrific conflicts that we have around us. I was a boy, it was World War II. I remember the sirens that would go off, thinking that perhaps planes were coming over the city that I was in. But Jesus said regarding wars, he said, I want you to be very careful. Wars by themselves are not a sign of Jesus coming. And watch how this unfolds. Jesus' cautions weren't done yet. Over and over, he advised us to watch. That is an imperative. That's a command. If we are to watch, there must be something we need to see or observe and to watch, right? There's something we need to discover about prophecy. If there's something we need to observe to tell us when Jesus is coming soon. And that's one of the reasons for this all the discourse. We're about to uncover exactly what he meant. But first, it is important to note that this is not the only place that this divine request comes to us. Revelation 3.3. It says this. Pay attention to these words. It's something we sometimes skip over. If you don't watch... I will come as a thief. Do you catch the logic of Jesus? This is Jesus speaking. If you don't watch, I will come as a thief. Meaning, if you watch, 
you're not going to be surprised, right? So there's things we need to be studying and understanding from these prophecies that is apropos to our time. There's a similar reference in Revelation 16, 15. Paul has amazing insight regarding all this. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, here it is again, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness. No. There's something different about those that understand prophecy. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Are you catching the message? There's something we need to delve into to understand more deeply about end time prophecy. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. And here it is again, just like Jesus said, but let us watch, be sober, have a clear mind, understand really what is going on. Paul's qualifier, if you know, he will not come as a thief. There are things we can know. They are found right here in Matthew and in the book of Daniel. We can know the details so well, his coming won't be as a thief. It didn't say that we would know the day or the hour, but it would come as a thief. And there's many things that tell us when it's close. There are other warnings, but Jesus is now ready to answer one of their questions. Watch the details, folks, as we go into this deeper. The disciples had asked, what will be the sign of the end of the world? And this is Jesus' answer. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. That's a timing point, isn't it? And the event is the gospel to the whole world. But there's a warning. What does Jesus really mean? by this. When the gospel goes to the whole world, we know that it occurs at the time of the loud cry. From many things that Ellen White has shared with us, everyone will then make an eternal decision. Then the whole world will be divided into two camps, wheat and tares, sheep and goats, righteous, sinful, purified and wicked, right hand, left hand, what does the Bible say as to how we will know when the gospel goes to the whole world? It doesn't tell us. That's important. Had that us make the assumption that we will know that, but the Bible doesn't tell us that. That is going to be during the final cry of the two witnesses noted in Revelation 11. What does it say about those witnesses? They're filled with the Holy Spirit. There will be no use for databases, monthly evangelism reports, progress in baptism, what country is yet in spiritual darkness. Every country is going to hear the gospel message at that time. God will lead and drive us forward. We will not know when this work will be finished. We will be driven by sharing the convicting truths that each one of us have in our hearts and minds. Thus, the gospel to all the world. Think. These are important <coughs> concepts as we analyze prophecy. The gospel to all the world will not be an anticipatory sign. I will not be able to go out in the streets of Victorville and begin to preach. Jesus is coming soon because the gospel has gone to the whole world. That won't make sense, will it? Because the gospel has already gone to the whole world. You see what groundwork Jesus is trying to lay for us. This is when everyone's response to the Spirit's convicting truths. That is the key issue. The whole world will hear 
excuse me, Earth's dramatic and urgent presentation of the gospel tied to end time prophecies. Ellen White noted those final movements will be very rapid ones. We kind of know how rapid that will be from the book of Daniel. Have you ever analyzed in depth the first angel's message? It was in our order view this morning. That angel, God's end time messengers, cries with a loud voice, and part of that message is the hour of his judgment has come. There's a reason that we have urgency in our first, second, and third angel's message. One hour has arrived that is suddenly giving stunning urgency to our message. It is related, and this is a whole seminar that we conduct, it is related to Revelation 4. We must know the prophecies so that the final message is not only convicted, but people sense that a decision for Jesus Christ is now a very urgent issue. Does that make sense? That's how God has tried to design these prophecies and end time movements so people sense it is now time to make a decision. This is the time that a wonderful Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled that Joel gave and Peter quoted in Acts 2. And it shall come to pass afterwards when God's people will be specially favored that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Did you catch that? And your sons and your daughters and your prop shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Did you notice that pouring out the Holy Spirit is to all flesh? Yeah. Important. It's a crucial issue. The whole world will be coming under a convicting message that we, as his witnesses, will be given at that particular time. All of mankind will hear this message, and when all of mankind does, Jesus said the end would come. For those not receiving visions and dreams, it is so strong, they are brought to some decision. This is the time when the whole earth is drawn into two camps. The Spirit brings convicting decisions. How can this happen? The entire world has received a knowledge of truth because of the witnessing and the evangelism and the work we are doing under the latter reign. So completely, they now make a decision for or against God. Again, the gospel to the whole world cannot be an anticipatory warning sign that we are preaching. Because when it happens, then Jesus is coming. We won't know when the last convicting truth comes to all the hearts of mankind during that final period of the latter reign. Ellen White said in the story of redemption, and I saw angels hurry to and fro in heaven, an angel with a writer's ink cord by his side returning from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark, containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. Incidentally, for those of you that are connoisseurs of Revelation and the details, Revelation 8, verse 5, where something is thrown down, it is actually in the Greek, the, the coals are thrown down, it's not this particular quote. He raised his hands and with a loud voice, it is done. Will we know before the angel reports to Jesus that the work is done? Certainly not. That means it is not a sign to warn others. <coughs> Question number two. The disciples query, what would be the sign of your coming? Kind of an interesting question to know for them and for us. Let's analyze several texts. 
At the transfiguration, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, and I won't finish the rest of that, God's presence is associated with a cloud in numerous references in Bible texts. There came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Same concept. While they beheld, he was taken up in a, what? A cloud received him out of their sight. The cloud received and then contained his presence. The cloud is a vehicle to move Jesus' presence. When we ascend up into heaven, we will be caught up into a cloud to meet Jesus in the air. Revelation 11, verse 12. Where Jesus is waiting to personally meet each one of us. Could the cloud be a sign? And he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. Interesting, do you think a cloud rising from the east might never be a sign? Whereas lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in what? Clouds. There it is again. Of heaven with power and great glory. The clouds are the sign of the arrival of Jesus. Jesus announced to the apostate leaders in Jerusalem and to the repugnant high priest Caiaphas this warning sign. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, that is a divine decree. Hereafter shall ye see something obvious that they can be seen. The Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, apparently on a throne, he will present as a king, coming in the clouds of heaven. The clouds are the sign of Christ's coming. Begin to think what this really represents. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1, 7, that familiar text to Seventh-day Adventists. In describing what this all might be like, Ellen White said, soon our eyes were drawn to the east for a small black cloud had appeared about half as large as a man's hand, which we all knew was the sign of the Son of Man. There it is. You see what's happening as we analyze these verses? Something very unusual is transpiring about our information regarding the second coming of Jesus. We all in solemn silence gazed on the cloud as it drew nearer, lighter, brighter, more glorious, and still more glorious till it was a great white cloud. But there it is again a problem question that must be addressed. If the gospel to the world is not a sign that we can preach in anticipation, and the cloud is not of anticipation because Jesus is already here, right? The work is done. Jesus has returned, and there he is in the cloud. There's only one question left that Jesus is not answering for the disciples. When shall these things be? Are you with me? Does this make sense? So far, so good. Good. The only thing we have yet to hear Jesus is to talk about timing. We shouldn't feel reticent to talk about timing. 
There are quotations that many people use from Ellen White's writings. And I have a book one of my students wrote on this. Most of the quotations they use to block any time in discussion are taken out of context. The only thing we now hear is what Jesus is about ready to share, which is of utmost value to us. One area which is really a seminar study in itself, what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15. If you want to know the rest of the story, Jesus said, go to Daniel where it talks about the abomination that leads to, and here's that word again, the abomination that leads to desolation. Here in Matthew 24, he has something else very important to share. When will these things be, the disciples ask? Jesus now responds. He's now going to fill in some of these details. You see how beautiful it is when we begin to analyze these verses. The research we do, we go phrase by phrase in lexicons to try to unfold the truths. And I hope all of you somewhere, someplace, have access to lexicons. For nation to rise against nation. This is verse 7 and 8. This now is a new key transition in Christ's teaching. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That represents war, but now attached to other things, not standing by itself. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these things are the beginnings of sorrow. Wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and in Luke, devastating events in the sky, which we assume represents hurricanes and tornadoes and things into that category. Well, how do we analyze this? How do we know what this really means? Jesus said we are to understand these events, and now we're dealing with a when question. How do we relate to this today? The beginning of sorrows actually means the onset of travail or birth pains. Some of the translations in the Bible you folks have relate to that, and it's translated correctly. It is not in the King James. How do birth pains come? Again, I'm inviting you to think real carefully. They get more frequent and more severe. That is actually a mathematical curve Jesus is talking about. And those of you that know mathematics, it's an exponential curve. An example of that is here on the screen. It is not a straight line. Things become more frequent and they become more severe. Jesus said that when these things begin to come in this type of curve, that's how he's describing it. It means the end is near. In an exponential curve, there is a point in time that is reached where we can mathematically determine that the end will keep on going of that curve. The baby will come, the economy will collapse, collapse oil prices will continue to rise, and we could list over a hundred things with great ease. A question, are calamities following this pattern? Watch. Ellen White said this would be a sign that the end is near. I think you've read this before. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. She says it. That's just what the Bible says. She's talking about an exponential curve. He's also saying it will be that curve that I just mentioned. What was the list of things we had to watch for in a collective exponential curve? Wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and celestial disasters. Is this type of trend being followed anywhere? 
Both it is. In the countries of Belgium and Germany, the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters, CRED, at the Catholic University of Louvain, Belgium, receives millions and millions of dollars every year to analyze calamities around the world. And the history of clouds, they have quite accurate data going back to 1900. They have networked with many international agencies, including the United Nations, to create a very precise trend database of natural disasters. This is what they have found. If you want to go on the website and put this on a little note, if you're scribbling any notes, go and do a Google search, EM-DAT, and you'll come up with an incredible amount of data. This is one of their charts. Statistically, it was in this 1977 through 1981 window that a trend upward in global disasters was apparent, the kind of disasters that Jesus talked about. Well, is this secularizing too much, the Bible? I hope not, because this is exactly what Jesus suggested we analyze, and Ellen Roy also told us to understand. It was in 1978, approximately, that the trend began fulfilling Christ's prophecies regarding these disasters. We have verified this data with the Catholic University of Louvain, and I've written also to the Munich Reinsurance Company in Germany. Their data, incidentally, is independently derived, excuse me, derived, but they go and they can be templated over each other. There is now an ongoing upward trend with these issues becoming more frequent and more severe that we can objectively share and talk about. This is exactly, brothers and sisters, what Jesus asked us to do. Will you watch? Watch for what? Watch for the signs that I am talking about that will show that my coming is near, right? That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Watch. He said it over and over in Matthew 24. Please note carefully these next few thoughts. Jesus said when one sees all these things coming together, not one at a time, not like war, which he gave a special warning not to look at that alone. When they, all these things come together, as when a fig tree puts forth its leaves, Jesus said at that time his coming is even at the doors. This is further clarified in Luke's record, and when these things begin to come to pass, when these things end, when half of these things begin, when all these things, Luke says in several, a couple other verses, begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, don't just raise up your eyebrows or your eyes, Lift up your heads for your redemption draws God. Jesus is coming soon. That means here this morning, as we are analyzing some of the issues related to these verses, we can say to each other, I can say from this pulpit, folks, we have arrived at a time that we can objectively say not subjectively like we have for over 100 years. We can objectively say here this morning, folks, there are reasons that Jesus is now coming soon. This may be one of the most pointed warnings from Jesus. When, G when things begin to collectively start and ready to come, but that's not all, there's more. Did you notice that Jesus included very, two very important things in this morning? He used the word when and begin. So there is a clock he wants us to be aware of. And that's why Jesus told us to go to Daniel 
the study about the abomination of desolation. That is Daniel 8 through 12. When these things begin to come to pass, these things, Luke 21, 28, that is absolutely stunning. Jesus has given to us so much information. He said, has another warning. Once these things begin to occur, all will happen in one generation. Many may want to resist this thought, but it's in the Bible. Because it's in the Bible, I want to analyze it and pay attention to it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. You might be thinking that referred to the day when Jesus was talking with the disciples. You all know, Adventists know, Ellen White understood that this is a dual prophecy. This is how scholars understand these verses. Outside scholars and also within our church. No matter what generation it refers to, when these things begin to come to pass, collectively, some end is in sight. Does that make sense? That goes right along with the context that Jesus gave us. One end was in sight for the Jewish people, the destruction of that amazing temple. For us, one end is in sight. It's the coming of Jesus. How long is the generation? Well, just briefly, there are different ways to view this. The most common, and it could be a trap, we have to be careful. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years until their carcasses be, excuse me, wasted. Numbers 14, and the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord were consumed. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed 40 years after Jesus gave this prophecy. Ellen White says during the entire 40 years in the wilderness, the people were very, every week reminded of the sacred obligation of the Sabbath by the miracle of the man. Yet, even this did not lead them to obedience. That's so sad. There was great laxness in the observance of the fourth commandment. And this is enumerated among the reasons for the exclusion of the first generation in the promised land. Jeremiah preached for one generation, warning the Jew that Judah would fall to Babylon exactly 40 years later. Nebuchadnezzar attacked and the first captives were taken. If these conclusions are correct, and they are, then one generation somewhere from 1977 to 1981, our redemption will be even at the doors. Did Jesus say Jesus would come? No, we can't set that date. We have to be extremely careful but Jesus had a very healthy concept in Matthew 24. He said, when you see these things come, begin to come to pass, know that he is even at the door. You've had people knock on your door or ring your doorbell. It doesn't mean when the doorbell is rung that they are in the house, but it means they are ready to come into the house. He's even at the doors. Jesus made it clear we have to know when he is even at the doors. Prejudice must not rule our prophetic study. Ellen White says only the exact day and hour are not known. Very interesting dynamic. She added that word exact in her writings after 1890. There's more, so much more than Jesus is telling us in Matthew 24. This is the format he uses. I hope you've analyzed this before. Disaster list, we just went over that. Then comes persecution. People would hate each other. Promise of special blessings to God. And then right in the middle of this prophecy, Jesus takes a break. There's a lot of reasons for that we don't have time to talk about this morning. 
He takes a Daniel break. If you want to know the rest of the story, go to Daniel to fill in those details. Now, after the Daniel break, he picks up the prophecy for us today. There's a time of tribulation, celestial sign, second coming, and then miscellaneous themes. Did you know that there is falling of the stars, dark day, after Jacob's trouble? It's right there in Matthew 24. This graph shows that. What does Jesus really mean in that break? This is something that Ellen White has said. Reverse, and then I'll get to something she said about this. When a time in the word, ye shall therefore see the abomination of desolation. This is verse 15. A singular event, a sign we can perceive, spoken by Daniel the prophet. Now we know where to look. Stand in the holy place, something horrible comes into the church. Whoso readeth, let him understand. That's stunning. God is very precise, very accurate, very directional, and most complete. It is to Daniel we are to go and to a very specific place for the rest of the story that Jesus introduced us to in Matthew 24. We are to go to Daniel where he talks about the abomination of desolation tied to the transgression of desolation. Transgression in Hebrew is pishah. Pishah means rebellion against God's law, his covenant, and his authority. What is that? It's a sad. Think about it. We are silent in Daniel 8 through 12. Did Ellen White have sensitivity regarding this? Listen to what she has to say, phrase by phrase. To the period just prior to the appearing of the Son of Man. She's looking forward to when this was written in 1883. The prophecies of Scripture point. And here their warnings and threatenings preeminently apply. Now notice what is within that period. The prophetic periods of Daniel, periods plural of Daniel, extending to the very eve of the great consummation of Rome. She's looking forward, and there's something in Daniel moving forward to that very important period of time, periods, throw a flood of light upon events then to transpire. The book of Revelation is also replete with warnings and instructions for the last generation. I had 60 people that worked with me to go through the book of Revelation nearly 20 years ago. It took us 10 years. Phrase by phrase. Fascinating. Much of the book of Revelation has historical connotations to it, as Adventists understand. But we try to answer a different kind of question. Does this phrase, this verse, this context, this chapter, have relevance to God's people today in Revelation? And I can share with you it was stunning the things that began to unfold with our team. There's something in Daniel that goes right up to the second coming of Christ that she calls periods. I can tell you where they are, but that's another seminar in itself in Daniel 12. The beloved John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, portrays the fearful and thrilling scenes connected with the close of Earth's history and presents the duties and dangers of God's people. None re need remain in ignorance. None need be unprepared for the coming of the day of God. Amen. You might be thinking, this is all too much information. I only need to have faith in Jesus. Then you assume part of the Bible is not important. Possibly. Ellen White was so burdened regarding this. She said, let us show the people where we are in prophetic history. 
That's pretty objective, isn't it? How can we show people where we are in prophetic history unless we have some in-depth understanding of what it means to be even at the doors for Jesus to come? That's a timely concern. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arise the spirit of true Protestantism awakening the world. One of the things that helps create urgency at the end of time is that there is a timing message so clear we can confidently say he's even at the doors and the hour of his judgment has arrived. There's a lot to fully understand and study out folks for us to really present these things to the world. Ellen White also said he has a chart pointing out every waymark on the heavenward journey. And we ought not to guess at anything. I take that quotation to mean maybe it's time not to be subjective. Maybe it's time to be objective. Maybe it's time to really understand the facts. Maybe it's time to know that the hour we are living in, Jesus is really at the doors. The record of Jesus' discourse on the Mount of Olives is only introductory to end time prophecy. Daniel is loaded with prophecies apropos to us. The book of Revelation is filled with, filled with stunning messages. Ain't for right now. Have we said any dates today? No. Can we say that his coming is even at the doors? Yes. I hope so. It is even at the doors. Therefore, Jesus said, still in Matthew 24, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man May God help you folks to get excited about digging deep into God's Word and at this hour especially into His promises. Amen.